I'm going to tell you about a project called Hyperspectral Inverse Skinning. This work was primarily done by my former PhD students, Sang Run Liu and Jian Xiao Tan, uh, and uh, in collaboration with Professor Zhigang Deng at the University of Houston. So before I tell you about inverse skinning, um, I'd like to tell you about linear blend skinning. Uh, so linear blend skinning is an animation technique uh, where uh, we choose a set of handles uh, and the handles represent convenient things, uh, manipulators for a character. So they could be uh, some kind of virtual bones. Uh, and then for each handle, we assign some point-wise weights, some per-vertex weights. These weights are fixed for the entire animation, uh, and different vertices have different weights. And these weights are used to blend the um, transformation matrices associated with each handle. So the designer or the animation uh, um, uh, adjust the transformation matrix associated with each handle, and the shape moves by applying the weighted average transformation um, across the shape. This is a standard in many parts of computer graphics, particularly for real-time animation. Now in inverse linear blend skinning, what we're trying to do is uh, the opposite. So we're given the animation, the final animation, the way the vertices of a mesh move in 3D over time, and we are trying to figure out what the weights should be and what the handles should be and what the transformation matrices should be for this shape. So we can express this formally in a kind of least square sense. Uh, and uh, we're not the first ones to look at this problem, but we have a different approach. We have a new approach. Okay, our approach is that inverse lin linear blend skinning is a problem in high dimensions. So we can think of transformation matrices, uh, these are affine matrices, as points in uh, R12, 12 dimensional space. And a, a handle has a transformation matrix across all animation frames or all poses. So that's 12P, P for the number of poses. So R12P, so 12P dimensional space. And so here we've got a little uh, coordinate axis for 12P dimensional space. Uh, and we can see here this uh, simple shape with these handles. Uh, the handles, each handle, all of these transformations across all uh, poses are these points in high dimensional space. When we do linear blend skinning, we're taking weighted averages of these transformations. So each vertex has different weights for a weighted average, and we see those weights, uh, we see that, that that also gives us a point in 12p dimensional space. Uh, these handles, the handles themselves form a simplex in this space, and the vertex transformations all lie inside of it because they're weighted averages. And the weights uh, for any point inside of the simplex are its barycentric coordinates. All right, so this brings us to uh, our approach. So an overview of our approach. So step one, we're gonna estimate vertex transformations in 12p dimensional space. That is every vertex we have, we, have, uh, we know where it goes in 3D. And uh, so we're gonna estimate the transformations that, that uh, that bring it there. Uh, so we're going to estimate the transformations for a vertex uh, across all of its poses, and that will give us a point in 12p dimensional space. And then once we have those uh, those vertex transformations, we'll estimate a subspace, a handles dimensional subspace for those vertices. And once we have that handles dimensional subspace, that's the subspace in which we need to find a simplex, a smallest enclosing simplex for those. Uh, any enclosing simplex will have the same error, and the smaller simplex will mean sparser weights. Great, so let's first look at uh, this uh, uh, estimating vertex transformations in 12p, and then we'll see how we use this to, uh, to uh, uh, simultaneously get our handled dimensional subspace. These two steps are going to be uh, merged. Okay, so um, estimating vertex positions in 12p dimensional space. So we know the vertex's rest and deformed position in 3D. And that right there, that sets up a set of a linear system of equations. That sets up some linear equations and, and it constrains, and th those linear equations constrain the possible handle transformations that could happen to this vertex. Uh, and it constrains them to lie on an affine subspace that's 9p dimensional. Now this is very abstract, but this uh, affine subspace, uh, there's another term for that that mathematicians like to use, it flats. We can find uh, a, a flat for the handles that, that intersects all of these uh, flats that, that are uh, implied by the motion of the vertices, then, uh, then, then we found a zero error solution space uh, to inverse skinning. 
uh, that handled dimensional um, flat, that's where uh, our, our uh, inverse uh, rig will live. So if we can do that, then, then we've succeeded. And if we can't do that, then maybe we can minimize the distance between this handle transformation flat, the space where the handle transformations uh, lie, and each of these individual vertex flats. Okay, so is this a, uh, is finding a flat, uh, the closest flat to another set of flats easy? Um, in, in fact, it's a hard problem. Um, in general, it's not convex. Um, and to get a sense for how hard it is, we, we did some experiments. So we can generate random d-dimensional flats that intersect a known k-dimensional flat, and we can check different values of k and d and see what happens. So can we recover the k-dimensional flat? The, the, and there's a known one. Uh, can we recover it from a random initial guess? All right, so here's a plot of, uh, of, of this experiment, and I'll just I'll highlight some things. So when d equals zero, the given flats are actually zero-dimensional, they're points. And so what we're trying to do is it's it, the, the we're trying to find a uh, like a, a plane or a flat that's closest to a set of points, and that's actually that's that's a simple least squares problem, just trying to find um, the closest flat to a given point. Okay, so that that's easy. Um, when d plus k is greater than or equal to twenty four, it's trivial because a random initial guess is just almost surely going to intersect all the flats. That's like saying find the plane. Uh, in 3D that, that's closest to a bunch of given random lines. In general, all, any plane is going to intersect all of the lines. Okay, uh, but to the lower left uh, of, this, of, this, of this grid, um, it, it takes, some, it takes some, uh, some iterations, and as d plus k approaches 24, when it's less than 24 but approaches 24, we see there's a very difficult zone there where uh, we, we hit our maximum number of iterations, we never found good solutions, so there's, there's, there's this difficult zone in there. Um, and that's kind of um, that's kind of the space that our problem lives in. And we tried many, many possibilities um, for op solving this. Um, and uh, we have an appendix to our paper, how not to minimize flat, flat distances, which goes through uh, many alternative strategies. I'm gonna tell you about the one that worked uh, the best and the one that we propose. Okay, so, uh, so the first thing is to find that initial guess. And this is that step one, we need to take our vertices and we need to take each vertex and, and guess a 12p dimensional uh, point for each uh, vertex. Okay, so uh, how do we do this? So if a vertex and its one ring move rigidly, then uh, there's actually a unique solution. Um, if, it, if it moves rigidly, then there's gonna be, we're gonna see all the flat of a vertex and its neighbors, those are all gonna actually intersect each other uh, very nicely and have a, a, a unique, perfect, um, a single point where they all, where they all intersect. Uh, so the, the nine P, those nine P dimensional flats of a vertex and its, its one ring neighborhood can actually give us uh, a, um, a great a great solution uh, and if they don't intersect perfectly we can still we can try to find the point in 12p dimensions which is closest to uh, the vertex and its one ring neighbor uh, those 9p dimensional flats and so this is uh, a version of that least squares problem this is that least squares problem which is measuring the error in uh, 12p dimensions uh, and we can also measure the error in 3D. We can say, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the point in 12p dimensions, which actually minimizes the, the projected error that we would observe if we observe the motion of those vertices in 3D. Okay, and that's, that's what we use. Uh, and then once we have this, once we have a bunch of points in 12p dimensions, uh, one for each vertex, we can uh, run PCA, principal component analysis, on those points, uh, and then keep only the first uh, handles minus one uh, dimensions of that principal component analysis. And that gives us an initial, initial guess for a flat. And so now uh, um, that's, that's, that's our initial guess. And now let's optimize it. Let's, let's make everything uh, a variable and let's optimize it. So we'll use one of our expressions for a flat. We'll use an explicit one, the weighted average one. So we have F, uh, the columns of F are points on the flat and W. Uh, and, uh, and we are uh, searching for um, values of F and WI. Um, which reproduce the observed action of the vertices in 3D. Okay, and so this is actually, this, this expression is quadratic, it's quadratic in F and it's quadratic in W. Um, uh, and so uh, this gives us an, uh, an, an alternating optimization strategy. So we can alternate between local and global steps. We can alternate between 
steps uh, wi so that's like given points given given a flat find the closest point on the flat to uh, to the the vertex the to the observed uh, constraint of the vertex or the motion in 3d and uh, then a global step so once we have all these closest points let's actually try to update the flat uh, um, the flat itself uh, uh, to, to, to better match the observed motion of the vertices. And that global step uh, entails solving a linear matrix equation, um, which uh, actually boils down to solving a 4H by 4H system of equations, so not too bad. So we end up doing, we end up alternating between something per vertex and then a global system that's not too, not too big. Uh, and we can, we can visualize the optim optimization steps. Uh, so let's take a simple example. Let's take a cylinder with four handles. Uh, the the uh, the the simplex for four handles uh, for four handles is a tetrahedron, so it's got, it's got four points, and a tetrahedron uh, lives in three dimensions. So the handle flat itself is three dimensional. So we can visualize the closest points on the flat uh, to the cylinder vertices. So the, each of the cylinder vertices are at a, a, a point in twelve p dimensions, but uh, we can we can we can we can project them onto this uh, handle flat, which we have to do anyways to, to evaluate our error. And now we have points in three D when we do that. Um, uh, and so uh, so that's what we'll visualize here. Okay, so uh, we have our handle simplex tetrahedron. The handle flat is three D, and we're going to visualize them as points projected onto a handle flat optimizing from our initial guess. And so this is sort of in slow motion because it converges in about 10 iterations. So that's very nice. And we can we actually we can see here that these points end up forming the edges of a tetrahedron, uh, which is which is which is which is correct in the case of this uh, cylinder. Uh, each vertex is a combination of uh, only two of the handles. So that's what we see. We see all the transformations end up associated with edges of a tetrahedron. We see the uh, Arnish proposed initial guess and this random initial guess, and after 1, 5, 10, and 20 iterations, our proposed initial guess does very well, uh, and the random initial guess does not do very well. Uh, so now, at this point, we have a, a handled dimensional subspace for the vertices. Um, and we have our vertices. Each vertex is, is a point in this handled dimensional subspace. So let's, uh, let's, let's find the smallest enclosing simplex. So where, where does this come from, this idea come from? So uh, hyperspectral image unmixing um, is a problem in uh, hyperspectral imaging. And the idea here is that you have satellites which are capturing high dimensional data from far away. So uh, any pixel uh, is uh, gonna contain say mixtures of objects. There may be multiple things in there. There may be um, some tree coverage and some soil coverage and some maybe some water uh, or there could be um, uh, fire or there could be um, uh, any of different kinds of minerals. And so the, um, uh, we're, we're observing these pixels and the pixels are mixtures. And so we want to know what, what are the things in this image? Like what are the, what, what, uh, what are the pure, uh, what different object categories are there? Uh, and what mixtures are of those objects are in each pixel. And so the terminology in hyperspectral image unmixing is end members. And for us, those are handles. And for them, it's abundances. And for us, it's weights. And the observation that the minimum volume enclosing simplex uh, gives a nice solution is due to uh, Craig from 1994. The proposal was perform PCA and then find the minimum volume enclosing simplex. So here are some points, convex hull, a lot of points. Uh, uh, convex hull just wraps up some of those points. It's, it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not useful, but the, the minimum volume enclosing simplex is, uh, uh, gives us a, 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 nice, a nice solution. Uh, and there's been a lot of work on this, a um, bunch of state-of-the-art approaches, uh, um, a lot of attention. In theory, this should be difficult. In theory, it's, again, not convex, many local minima, um, infinite families of solutions, but it seems to work well in papers. Uh, and in theory, it gets easier the higher the dimension. All right, there's also a relationship here to non-negative matrix factorization, um, if you're curious. Okay, so we can state this problem formally. So we can say uh, we want to minimize the volume of a simplex. And to do that, we minimize the determinant of uh, a matrix C, uh, whose columns are uh, the vertices of the simplex and homogeneous coordinates. Uh, and uh, we do that subject to um, the weights for our observed data D, the weights being uh, positive or non-negative. So that's C inverse D greater than or equal to zero. And also um, subject to the 
positions should be in homogeneous coordinates. Okay, uh, minimizing determinant is a little bit gnarly because um, there's a, a super linear, there's like an exponential blow up in uh, the magnitude there. So we're taking the negative log determinant of a matrix X subject to XD greater than or equal to zero. And X is like already the inverse of C. Uh, and uh, and this, this actually has, uh, this actually works uh, much nicer in practice. Um, and we use a recent sequential quad quadratic programming approach to solving this. Okay, let's look at some results. All right, um, so uh, comparison to uh, smooth skinning decomposition with rigid bones. Uh, so our approach uh, runs faster and has lower error compared to uh, SSDR technique. Uh, and let me highlight some differences here. So here's a close up, um, and uh, we're using flat shading to emphasize the surface quality here. And you can see on the uh, the, the haunch of the elephant, uh, it, um, ours matches the ground truth, the input, and uh, uh, subspace deformation with rigid bones does not. And uh, also on the belly. Okay, here's another example. Uh, this horse is behaving very non-rigidly, um, which is very challenging for the SSDR technique since it maintains transformation rigidity. Uh, but you can see here around the neck, uh, and uh, around the legs, um, it, there's the surface has uh, lost a lot of its smooth qualities. Okay, uh, there's another technique uh, due to Kavan et al. Uh, and uh, here's an, just a numerical comparison. And we can see that uh, our error is much lower, um, or substantially lower, uh, um, although our approach doesn't consider sparsity, which theirs does. Uh, and But our approach is slower, um, Kavan's approach takes, is highly optimized and takes advantage of their sparsity assumption. Okay, let me show you just some ground truth recovery. Uh, so uh, our, our algorithm actually recovers the ground truth for simple cases. So in these cases, uh, we're seeing the, the weights look the same, the color is, is arbitrary, um, but the, 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 for each handle is arbitrary, but the, 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 the weights are the same. Uh, and, uh, but for, uh, for, more difficult cases, um, the vertex positions for a transformation are identical, um, but we have recovered them with different handle transformations and weights. Now, uh, to make the problem, let's say a little bit easier, let's say we're given, let's say we skip steps, uh, uh, step one, just step one, and give ourselves um, the ground truth transformation matrices that were applied per vertex. Um, so we're, we're sort of um, just evaluating uh, NVES in this case. We're sort of just evaluating step three because uh, um, uh, because we're we're given uh, we're given those uh, twelve p-dimensional positions and uh, this, there's a known ground truth um, solution here. So just, uh, step two is sort of trivial, um, and so it's just step three that's being evaluated in this case. And we can see that given true per vertex transformations, uh, our NVES does recover the true, correct, ground truth, handles, and weights. So that's that's um, intriguing. Um, there's another application here, which is mesh animation compression. So mesh animation compression measures, measures success in uh, bits per vertex per frame. That's the sort of tunable parameter, um, how many bits you have per vertex per frame for your animation. Uh, and in our case, weights uh, are this one time per vertex cost. So 32H bits per vertex uh, using floating point numbers. Uh, and then in each frame, uh, there's no per vertex cost. There's only a per handle cost, uh, which is shared by all vertices. So one affine matrix per handle. So that's a very low incremental cost per frame. Um, and, uh, and for the same uh, bits per vertex per frame budget, uh, we get a much lower uh, error than the state of the art. And uh, this, this difference just gets uh, uh, larger when the length of the animation increases. So in conclusion, uh, inverse skinning is a problem in high dimensional geometry. Uh, and when we do that, we, we can kind of have this uh, simple expression for, uh, for the problem, uh, which benefits from improvements to in a related field or uh, hyperspectral image on mixing, and also benefits from improvements to this closest flat problem. Um, there are some limitations to, to our technique. So we don't consider rigid transformations like uh, the SSDR technique. Um, those, uh, that means that our transformations may be less useful when a human wants to edit them afterwards. Um, and we also don't consider sparsity. So sometimes um, linear blend skinning weights uh, aren't sparse and shouldn't be sparse, but often uh, it's desirable to have sparse weights.
Um, and finally, we don't consider a bone skeleton. We end up with um, abstract handles. Thank you for watching.